Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Muff Punk Podcast. My name is Brandon, and I'm joined by Ralph and by Paul. And we're excited to bring you week three of the NFL action. I know that uh, we were excited to go through last week and make our predictions. We're excited to be a back-to-back with uh, weeks to shows. And uh, definitely happy to get into each and every little piece of action that we can. So what's up, gentlemen? Happy to have you. How are we doing tonight? we got sports to talk about. There's still football. We're not watching the debate. It's a good time. I think this is a really good idea that we decided to record the show while the debate is happening (laughs) because uh, it kind of forced all of us to step away from the BS and just to get to concentrate on hanging out with some buds for a little bit. And I think that's a much better place for our headspace to be. Agreed? Agreed. thousand percent. Awesome. So uh, if you're listening to the show, we do want to thank you. If you like it, make sure you leave a like. If you dislike it, make sure you dislike it. If you want to catch us, you can catch us not only here on YouTube, but on Spotify. Spotify and on Apple Podcasts, as well as on SoundCloud. We are all over the place. So if you ever want to catch us, you don't have to do it just on YouTube. We have plenty of places that you can go and do so. So done with all that, we're going to get into the game. So the first game that I wanted to cover this week is the Packers versus the Saints. We're going to kick the show off with the pack just like we did last week. Packers beating the Saints 37 to 30. Aaron Rodgers had a pretty great night going 21-32, 283 yards with three touchdowns. Now, one of the things that I thought was interesting is I wanted to kind of bring you guys a few facts about the game. So Aaron Aaron Rodgers is the first quarterback in NFL history to have at least nine passing touchdowns, zero interceptions, and be sacked two or fewer times in his team's first three games of a season. Pretty interesting there. Now, Drew Brees had his 94th career game with at least three passing touchdowns, breaking a tie with Peyton Manning for the most such games in NFL history. But I think the real big story of the game, out of of everything, was Alan Lazard, and he was 12th in the NFL with 254 receiving yards through the first three games. His average of 19.5 yards per catch ranks fourth among uh, league receivers with at least 10 receptions. Lazard ranks 14th in the league with at least 11 first downs and 19th in yards after the catch. He also has 13 receptions and two touchdowns. When the Packers were without Pro Bowl wideout Devontae Adams at New Orleans on Sunday, Lazard had a career night with six catches for 146 yards. That averaged 24.3 per catch and a touchdown. Not too bad for a guy that was on the unemployment line just 13 hours ago. So 13 months ago. Sorry. So, guys, what were your thoughts on the game? We're going to start with our resident pack fan, Paul. Let me hear it. All right. So um, I, I, I felt like this week was going to tell a little bit more of a tale for the Packers season because the first two weeks they played the NFC North. And I mean, let's face it, at this point. If you take the Packers out, the Cowboys might be able to win a division. And uh, I think that rather than tell the tale of how good the Packers team is, I think it's telling the tale of how different a a football season without fans is. Because if uh, watching the game, Aaron Rodgers on the road had like, I think two for sure, maybe a third hard count where he got the defense to jump off sides. And uh, I mean, nobody does that in the Superdome. That that's a place that's it's like what like the third loudest in the NFL behind the Seahawks, who built the place to contain sound, and behind the Chiefs, who I mean, let's face it, what else do they have in, over there in Missouri? So I think that it's really interesting to see where this where the season is going and um, the differences that we we normally wouldn't because I I don't know. If the game plays out the same way and there's a crowd in the stands, I I don't think the Packers win this game. Um, But obviously, I'm not going to complain about a free win. Yeah, I would imagine not. What do you think, Ralph? Well, I'm, I'm, you know, ever impressed again by uh, Aaron Rodgers and and how well he's, you know, played. I mean, he had a scramble in that game that, you know, who knew Aaron Rodgers still had wheels. and and the the play by on the Saints side, Alvin Kamara. I mean, that guy is just th- that play. I thought it was a broken play, 
where, you know, basically Breeze almost laterals the ball to him. And then he just does all the work from there and gets into the end zone. I mean, I, it, it was it was pretty impressive to watch. And and not only that, but he's on my fantasy team. So having 47 points out of the guy was was a nice, uh, <laughs> nice addition to the weekend. But uh, no, man, the, the pack, they, they really uh, under that new coach. I mean, last year, they I, I think it was growing pains. And um, this year you're, you're seeing some of the benefits of, of, of being together. Um, and, and Aaron Rodgers growing under, under the new coach there. And, and really that running game with Jones and, um, you know, keeping that, keeping the defense, you know, honest, I mean, that they're, they're going to be, they're, they're going to be a tough play down the road. And, and Aaron Rodgers is just, I mean, what can you say about the guy? You know, one thing I wanted to bring up about Rodgers is he's, he came into the league the same year as Alex Smith, right? And in my mind, and I don't know why I do this, but in my mind, I always think Alex Smith is, is older and been around longer, but it's because Alex got the start first, you know, Rogers kind of sat the bench for a few years. So you almost feel like Alex Smith has been around longer, but Alex Smith, of course, due to injuries, not playing um and, and you know not the starter in, in washington but um you know for for aaron Rodgers to be uh doing it and doing it this well for this long uh is is really impressive and uh i think he's got a couple of years left in him and i don't think he should worry about you know that the was jordan love that they drafted um this year so uh pack pretty impressive so i, I do want to bring up one thing um, there was a, a graphic that, that came across during the game. And do you guys know how many touchdown passes Peyton Manning had to first round draft picks? I mean, doesn't I he spread around the ball more than almost anybody, right? Like he didn't, so, there's very few guys that he consistently threw to a bunch. But, but first round picks overall through his career, 293 touchdown passes. Wow. To first round draft picks. How many do you think Aaron Rodgers has? <laughs> uh, five, six, ten. <laughs> two. Wow, I wasn't that far off. Two. And both of two, and both of them are to Mercedes Lewis. And I think we can agree at this point in his career, Mercedes Lewis isn't exactly a pass catching tight end anymore. I mean, he's, he's no Sterling Sharp. Yeah, or Shannon. You know, well, I don't want to was play. Lewis drafted by Jacksonville? Yeah, he was drafted by Jacksonville. Uh, I think he spent, what, like 10 years there, 12 years? He had a long career with the Jaguars. And then he's been with the Packers for the last few years, and he just he hasn't done a lot. I mean, I, I love having him on the roster. I think it's always good to have heady veterans around if you can afford them. And this year he's got two touchdown receptions, and – those are the first two touchdown receptions that Aaron Rodgers has ever had to a first round pick. You know, that really does say a lot. I mean, we were talking about Jordan Love and talking about the different times that Aaron Rodgers, I know, has been hopeful that they were going to get him more weapons. And it just doesn't seem to work out. Do you think that that really that stat alone really speaks to that? Um, I, I do think that it speaks to that. I, so I think it, it, it has a couple of statements there in that one fact. First, I don't think that the Packers understand how to build a team. And the reason that I say that is because you had arguably a top five quarterback all time in Brett Favre while he was there. He goes to two Super Bowls, wins one, has a similar thing where he he makes great receivers out of people you've never heard of coming into the NFL. And then they go to Aaron Rodgers, who, I, I mean, let's, let's call a spade a spade. Aaron Rodgers is better than Brett Favre was. He, he turns the ball over less. He's one of the most talented quarterbacks that I've ever seen. Um, I'm not saying that he's the most accomplished or that he's the best, but I think that overall talent, he he is, if not the best quarterbacks I've ever seen, uh, with maybe, maybe Patrick Mahomes there on top of him, given all the ridiculous things that he's done in the league so far. Um, but I... I, I really like the, the coaching that's going on right now. Uh, Matt LaFleur is really good. Uh, my favorite thing actually about Matt LaFleur was uh, not having an ego coming into the system and keeping Mike Pettin as the defensive coordinator. I mean, think about how many guys come into a new coaching situation and they, they have to have their guy. But before Mike LaFleur was around, Mike Pettin had started to turn around the defense that Don Capers had, I don't know, them playing high school schemes or something, or it might be high school talent level people. 
Um, but it, it's just, it's night and day. And I love that Matt LaFleur was able to set aside his ego, keep him around. Because for most of Roger's career, when he was throwing really well, he didn't have a defense. And now he's got a defense and a running game, which is something that the Packers just haven't had in a long time. So I think it's going to be a fun season. Isn't how he can, off to – oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ralph. Sorry. How, how can uh, – and I get, I get so frustrated when the Eagles play the Packers because you know it's coming. You know the hard count's coming. You know it's going to happen. He's going to try it at least a half a dozen, you know, a dozen times, half dozen times, let's say, throughout the course of the game. And he gets them every time. And and how as a as an, uh, a defensive player, are you not prepared for that? Uh, I, I think what you have to look at is it, it's not that you're not prepared for it. It's that Aaron Rodgers is – if he's not the best hard count in the history of the game, he's top five. Oh, he's def- without a doubt. And and so you take that along with the fact that he knows how to use the free play better than any other quarterback that's been around. He turned, I, he turned that he turned that free play into a, a a first and goal from the one. Yeah, yeah. And did you see? He it looks like he almost called timeout, and then and then the guy had started to jump, so he snapped it right away. And then I don't know what the dude in the end zone is thinking, but that was the easiest pass interference call I think I've ever seen in my life at any level. So it was, it's just crazy. Isn't Matt LaFleur off to like the best start of any Packers head coach in the history of the Packers? Yes. And I think you kind of have to uh, take that with a grain of salt because he walked into a situation with a first ballot Hall of Famer. And uh, like um, I was watching a game with my wife this weekend and she's like, wow, better than Vince Lombardi. Vince Lombardi never. And I was like, hey, I'm like, that's, like, yeah. Lombardi, that's, that's a sacred name. Let's let's not make those comparisons <laughs> that quickly. Um, but yes, he, he by far has the best record through uh, 19 games now at 16 and three uh, of any Packers head coach. So it, it's great. Um, I, I've seen a really big jump in the offense from year one to year two since they had the, the whole off season, and uh, the defense is just stepped up and kind of picking off where they've left off the last couple of years. So it's really nice to see and something that I haven't been used to in a little while. All right, so I'm going to play a game with you guys the same as Paul does with us. How many throws over 20 yards did Drew Brees have in that entire game? Two. Ralph. Uh, I'm going to go with three. Zero. But that Camara pass wasn't, I mean, that that doesn't count as a. Uh, An actual, guess, actual 20 over yards. a pass that went over 20 yards. Gotcha. But yeah. Where, where was the one to Emmanuel Sanders? Because I, I thought there was one that was over 20. If not, it must have been real close. Yeah, I checked the stats right before the game or right before we came on because it had like that little readout. I'll see if I can find it again to send it over to you guys. But it did not look like he had any throws that went over 20 yards of actual like him having to throw the ball over 20 yards. Interesting. Yeah, that's the that's the power of Michael Thomas. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, it's it's a I think they are missing him so much. And I just think the defense is just letting them down really in these games. I mean, I know the Taysom Hill fumble really sealed the deal for them. I, that defense has got me definitely a bit worried going into uh, week four. So so real quick, I just want to touch on Taysom Hill. Yeah. Is it just me or is he the player that Tim Tebow could have been if he would have let himself be put in at different positions? I mean, obviously Taysom can throw better. But they, they got very him. similar body styles. That's that's a good that's a good point. I just I I, I loved watching Tim Tebow play in college, and I I loved watching that season that he had with uh, with the Broncos, where he beat the Steelers in the playoffs. Um, obviously, I yeah, I don't think he could throw. I think he probably would have been a better quarterback if he would have tied his left arm to his body and taught him to be a right-handed quarterback when he got into the NFL. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but it's I think it still just amazes me to see the, the just the athletic ability that Taysom Hill has. Yeah, he had that fumble, but if you look at everything that he does week in week out, he plays on the punt team. I mean, he's he's like their slash. He kind of reminds me of uh, Cordell Stewart before he became quarterback was uh, for the Steelers. 
And he's getting paid now too, isn't he? Yeah, I think he's like not a ton, but I know he, he did get a nice little chunk of money this season or this off season. Do you really think he's going to be the quarterback and waiting at this point? At this point, so I, I don't think we touched on this last week, but the the rumor was that if Drew Brees was going to retire, that they were going to go after Tom Brady with everything that they had, and then they brought in uh, Jameis Winston. While they have Taysom Hill on the roster. So I don't understand why you bring in Jameis Winston, who throws, what, 30 interceptions last year, when you have someone who looks as polished as Taysom Hill waiting to be the next quarterback. Uh, or if you were going to bring in Tom Brady. Like, I, Sure, I get it. It's Tom Brady. It's Drew Brees. They're obviously both first ballot Hall of Famers. But I don't understand why you sign – Jameis Winston when you have Taysom Hill on the roster. I was watching the uh, pro football focus last week. And uh, as you know, Chris Sims is on there and he was talking about Gruden being, uh, we'll, we'll do it the polite way. He was be a bit of a quarterback hoarder, maybe cut the end of that word off. If you catch my gist. Uh, so maybe <laughs> that's a bit of what that is, is just like, I'm just going to like I, the best quarterback out there is the quarterback I don't have right now. And if I have an option to put another arm on this roster, then I'm going to do it. That, that's fair. But uh, I don't think that Jameis Winston is an NFL quarterback. Yeah. You but I eat the W's <laughs> <laughs> with, with just $1 million. Isn't it just a $1 million contract? What was the contract he signed? I know it was like crazy little money. Uh, the, I, the million I think was to cam. I don't know what Jameis is making. Anything I'll have to double check much. that one. <laughs> <laughs> but, I don't know who's less qualified to start in the NFL, him or Mitch Trubisky. So Ooh, we'll get into that. <laughs> we'll, we'll get into that. Don't you worry. All right. Second game, probably the most painful game for me to get through this weekend was the Eagles tying the Bengals 23 to 23. Carson Wentz, 29 for 47, 225 yards, one touchdown, two interceptions. One of the bright spots I thought was Miles Sanders. He had 18 carries for 95 yards. Um, and also Greg Ward Jr., eight receptions, 72 yards, and a touchdown. Definitely super happy to see him be part of the offense again. I know last year he was like the only semi-bright spot the Birds had in the wide receiver core. So I was very happy to see him back. I think you had another week of... Not great play from Carson Wentz. I think the Bengals came ready to rock and roll. They knew that it was their game to lose. And uh, Joe Burrow did fairly good. I mean, to watch him sit in there and take that hit from Malik Jackson and then dust himself off and get up and still continue on with that game, I was very impressed. He was 31 for 44, 312 yards, two touchdowns. The thing that surprised me, Joe Mixon, only 17 carries for 49 yards. I really thought he was going to be more of a part of the focal point of the offense. But boy, Tyler Boyd, 10 catches, 125 yards, averaged 12.5 yards per catch. And it's just this was the Eagles, I feel like, showing all their weak points. So we'll start off with our resident Eagles fan, Ralph. What do you think? But I know you had a lot to say about this game. Well. <laughs> there's a lot to say, but uh, there's not much to say anymore. I mean, we've, we've said it and it's been said. Um, I think my, my text to you after uh, realizing that we were going to punt on a fourth down with nine seconds or whatever it was to go in the game and not give yourself even a chance to win the game. Um, I, I think I, I said that uh, I was effing done <laughs> this but like i said to you i mean you get no push up front on your d on the d line um your wide outs i mean w when you're complimenting greg ward as, as having a good game well it's easy to show out when you're the only you know when you're the only player that 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 does anything i mean he's the only one that showed any effort um you know like i, I texted you i said no wide out that can do anything more than run a straight line you know the the offensive line is 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 you know swiss cheese you know they can't block any longer than a half a second um you know like i said to you the 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 cornerbacks and the defensive backs are are just terrible mills he is not the answer leblanc is not the answer uh avante maddox got hurt um, 
you know, um, they, they just they have no answers for anything. And there's so many holes in this team. And then you draft you draft Jalen Hurts in the second round and you leave needs, points of need, areas of need on the draft board. Justin Jefferson, how good of a day did he have for Minnesota? And yet he's he's not on the roster because you draft Jalen Hurts. It, it just Every time I watch this team and every time I watch somebody that was on the board at the time when they drafted Hertz and they put themselves in this position now where everybody's going to start second guessing Carson Wentz. Carson's having a bad season. I get it. But Carson has shown you that he is a good quarterback and can be a good quarterback. Is he the long term answer? Nobody's going to know. He's got to prove it to me again. But when you draft Jalen Hurts, you're only opening the door to criticism, second guessing, and then the opportunity for the media and the fans to start pushing that that narrative of, oh, Carson's no good. We got to play Hurts, and you just create your own division, man. And Two that's words. The way I see this going. Two words. Max Kellerman. Good lord, I think he was like salivating like a rabid dog through the first couple weeks of the season, thinking of all the clips and and highlights that they were going to pull of Carson Wentz because he loves to shit all over Carson Wentz on first take. And that's like his new favorite thing to do. And good Lord, am I tired of hearing it? Go ahead, Paul. Maybe if you're tired of hearing it, you should, I don't know, maybe play better. (laughs) Um, No, I mean, and that's... That's a valid point. They should play better. But I mean, I think that a lot of these guys just love to dog pile on people when they don't perform well. But I, I got you. Go ahead. So I, I, I think just a continuation of what we said last week. It's time to cut the GM. It's time to rebuild the team because there's there's not much worth, worth saving at this point. Um, I do think that Carson can be a good quarterback. Uh, again, if you can get uh, a Jay Cutler-like return on him, I do that, and I just blow up the team. Um, although that seems to be all that Philadelphia teams do, regardless of the league. So who knows if that's the right answer. Paul, that, um, that, that answer kind of scares me, and I'll tell you why. Because as, as a Philadelphia fan, and we've, we've touched on this before, you know, watching our former players and our former you know, uh, heroes go to other teams and become you know, great and win championships and – you know, it, it's it's always it always seems to happen that you we we give up on people too soon. So at this point, as as a fan, I'm I'm you know very hesitant to say, you know, Carson's got to go, because I could just see. Could you imagine Gruden giving up? I mean, the Raiders will do anything. I mean, <laughs> they'd give up they'd give up a couple of ones for him, you know. And then he turns around and and you know just supplants you know Derek Carr out there and. They takes them to new heights. I mean, that these are the things that I, you know, uh, not fantasize about, but have nightmares about. I don't think that's going to happen because I think Gruden wants a young kid that doesn't know better than to just chuck the ball down the field and make that like split second decision and just not care. Where I think that's Carson, one of Carson's problems. But what were you going to say, Paul? Well, well, first, if that's what he wants, I, I think that he should just get James Winston. I mean, that sounds like a great fit. It guarantees the, the Raiders will get a couple of really good draft picks over the next three to five years that he plays. And I'm not getting there. But um, <laughs> I, I totally understand where you're coming from, Ralph. And it's got to suck. But believe me, I know because we had those middling years with McCarthy and, and Aaron Rodgers. And the entire time, I'm just like, come on, get rid of McCarthy. And the Packers just held on to him and held on to him. Do you have any idea how frustrating it is to watch NFC championship after NFC championship where you're supposed to win? You have what seems like an insurmountable lead, and then you have ridiculous comeback after ridiculous comeback. Make sure you're talking about the Falcons. Super Bowl. (laughs) Funny. (laughs) But no, I I just (laughs) I just I, I, I definitely understand wanting to keep Carson Wentz because I do think that he is a starting caliber quarterback, if nothing else, in the NFL. But if you have a starting caliber quarterback in the NFL, he's going to show flashes of greatness and lead you to just enough wins where your your draft pick isn't going to get you anybody that you really need. Yeah. Well, so, well do, you, do you think – here's – let me propose something to you because I started to think about this with, with, with the addition of Hertz, drafting him in the second round. You got him on a rookie deal for, what, four years? And mm-hmm. then you got 
maybe two or three years left on Carson's deal before you can really kind of, um, you know, maybe trade him, get some value out of him in the meantime, or, you know, not pick up that, uh, uh, there's an option and I forget what season it is, but let's just say, you know, the timing of this works to where, you know, if Carson's not playing well and continues to, to, you know, go downhill rather than show any progress, is it, is it foresight by the Eagles to do this or do they already know that have they already written the book on him in, in the front office is, you know, are they set? And if they are, then why are they make up their mind now? Not when they had Foles, you know, cause it's the same narrative Foles versus Wentz as it is Wentz versus Hertz. And that's what it's going to be. It's always going to be somebody else could be better than, but we don't know cause we haven't played them yet. So I don't know if this is actually, Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Paul. No, I, I just I think that it, it's a very interesting point. And as someone who watched Jalen Hurts for four years, I I don't know that unless he learned a ridiculous amount at Oklahoma his senior year, I don't know that he is an NFL quarterback. And I don't know that anybody else aside from the Eagles had him on their draft board. So I think it's a similar situation with what the Bears did with Trubisky, where you went after a quarterback that there wasn't a point to get him anywhere near where you got him. Um, Jalen would have been on until the third or fourth round, maybe even later. Um, I, so it's it, it's tough to say. Yes, it's it, sure. Maybe you can coach him up. He Jalen Hurts is an athlete, if nothing else. Um, and sometimes if you take that athleticism and you can teach him how to make decisions, sure, that's something that could happen. But I just – at this point, you're in the middle of paying Carson a good amount of money, and there, there's just no point at all to to waste a draft pick on Jalen Hurts in the second round when you need help, as you guys have both said over and over again, everywhere on the field. So I don't know if this is true or not, but and I wasn't <laughs> I wasn't wasn't necessarily going to bring it up, and maybe Ralph has heard about this and can confirm or deny. So I saw a post online. That was supposed to be from uh, Carson Wentz's mom, <laughs> and it it says that uh, it says that was not Peterson but Frank Reich that called and put the plays in the games in 2016 and 17. Peterson has been vanilla, and all the teams know what he's going to call. He is trying to make Carson into a robot. That is not Carson calling the plays. Carson should just turn off the headset and play like Carson. What do you guys think about that? I think it'll be interesting to see if Carson Wentz turns into Ryan Tannehill, where the Eagles let him go, and then he goes to a new franchise, signs a one-year deal, takes them further than anybody else thinks, and then he gets paid again. Um, I, I, I think that Carson has got the, the talent. Um, he, he won national championships as a college player. I think he's got the – I mean, I, I – there are times that where I see great flashes from him, and I think that he can do well. I I just think there are too many needs. Yes, I, I think that Peterson. I mean, think of, think about. I mean, we've all seen the the Super Bowl clip where Nick Foles calls the play the throwback to himself, and then Peterson just kind of laughs. So, at what point was Peterson making the calls, and at what point? Is he not a, a coach that you want around anymore? What do you think, Ralph? Well, I, I can't speak to the legitimacy of that uh, uh, that post if it's from Carson's mom or not. But you know, the Frank Reich had a had a big impact on Carson. We all know it. it it's it's blatantly obvious now. Um, and not having him in the room is is a big hole. And and you can say the same about uh, De Filippo and. Um, some of the other guys that have kind of gone on to, you know, coach elsewhere. Um, you know, he had a he had a whole room of coaches that were quarterbacks in De Filippo, uh, Reich, and also Peterson. So uh, that dynamic being gone, uh, he he doesn't have that same sounding board or um, play ingenuity, if you will. Um, but I, I just I, I got to hold on the hope that Carson's going to turn it around and become. Um, or revert back to, I should say, uh, the 2017 Carson and not the current incarnation of 2020 Carson. Um, you can only just hope that 2020 has gotten into his head a little bit and, um, 
you know, I just hope he turns it around. I, I know he can. Um, but again, like I said last week, I mean, the Eagles have to do a similar thing that that Seattle has done really and um, turn that team over to him more and more, uh, let him grow and develop in Doug's system and, and become, you know, almost the co-leader. I mean, Belichick and Brady, um, now Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes. I mean, every time the offense is uh, off the field, you know, who's sitting right next to Mahomes on the bench? Andy Reid. And, and that, you know, that, that team of coach and quarterback is, you know, is, is a huge thing. And you can see it with Mahomes and Reed and you saw it with Brady and Belichick. And, and I think you're, you could see that with Peterson and Wentz, but there just seems to be a disconnect right now. And I, I don't know what is in Carson's head. If it's the contract, if it's, you know, I'm a new father, blah, blah, blah. I mean, there, there's many reasons that could be, you know, kind of getting him down this year but um he's also got a big contract that should be telling him that he's a good player and giving him good vibes and telling you know and and doing positive things for him and i just don't see i don't see a lot in him right now he's making dumb mistakes terrible i mean those passes and and the first one was tipped it wasn't his fault but you know some of these plays that he's trying to force and i think he's trying to force them because he you know, these are plays that when he had good receivers, like, you know, when Alshon Jeffrey was, you know, uh, healthy, um, he would fight for balls. But you don't see these re- receivers coming back and fighting for the ball. I mean, they don't fight for anything. And that's part of the problem. And I think that has a lot to do with the interceptions. Not all of it, obviously, but uh, a lot to do with it. And, you know, if a young receiver is not running the right route or it doesn't fight for a ball or it doesn't make the right break. I mean, all those things that make it look like Carson made a bad throw could be on the receiver as well. And it's they're they're just sloppy all over the place. Uh, just one thing real quick. Uh, you guys both seem to have a pretty good feel for the is it fake or not. Um, has anybody checked if Kevin Durant was posting as Carson? <laughs> Ah, touche, touche. Damn, I didn't think about that one. <laughs> He's had a lot of time on his hands. He is he, he is a part owner of the Philadelphia Union now, so he does have Philadelphia ties. There we go. See, you never know. Man, didn't even think of that. Paul on the case. He's sleuthing it out, folks. <laughs> All right. Well, just like last week, let's move on so we don't beat that dead horse too much. Uh, so next game I wanted to cover is the Texans versus the Steelers Steelers coming out on top 28 to 21 Deshaun, uh, Deshaun Watson had an all right game going 19 for 27, 264 yards, two touchdowns, one interception. The thing that I think that was the most surprising to me is their rushing attack was non-existent. Uh, Duke, David Johnson had 13 carries for 23 yards, averaged 1.8 yards per carry. Uh, their biggest offensive player of the night, Randall Cobb, four receptions, 95 yards with a touchdown. I think it was definitely James Conner's night for the Steelers. He had 109 yards with touchdown, averaged 6.1 yards per carry. And uh, Steelers racked up overall 169 rushing yards in their week three win over the Texans. Houston dropped to 0-3 on the season and has allowed at least 160 rushing yards in all three games. The last team to allow at least 160 rushing yards in each of their first three games uh, of the season was the 2009 Texans. That team started one and two and then finished nine and seven and missed the playoffs. So, Ralph, what were your thoughts on the game? Well, uh, we can kind of make a comparison from Deshaun Watson to Karsten Wentz. I mean, Deshaun shows glimpses of, I mean, greatness. I mean, um, you know, he got tackled on the one play I saw, but I mean, he was fighting for his life to get out of there and, and was making, making every effort to get out of it. And, um, you know, it wasn't quite enough, but you know, when you're surrounded by five or six Steelers there's nowhere to go, but, um, you know, some of the, some of the touch, like he had a touch pass, uh, that was just, it was, it was pretty to fuller in the end zone in the left corner. Um, you know, so he, he kind of like Carson, he'll, he'll show you glimpses of greatness. And then, um, and then he made that one play. I mean, he just forced it and it was a close game. I think it was 21, 20 at that point. And then, you know, he, he rolls out, he's under pressure and then he forces that ball and it's intercepted. And that was a complete game changer at that point of the game. Um, 
on on the Pittsburgh side, they continue to find receivers. They continue to find running backs. And Ben Roethlisberger, like him or not, continues to chuck the ball down the field and, and let his guys go make plays. And, uh, you know, for whatever reason, Pittsburgh knows how to turn out running backs and, and wide receivers. They're, they're, they're quite the factory for them. So uh, Claypool's uh, an interesting prospect. Uh, obviously, Connor. And and Juju is is just doing doing Juju things. I think a huge addition for them too was Eric Ebron in the off season. You know, taking him from the Lions and bringing him over to the squad just to see him do big things for them. I think he's going to be a huge addition to them throughout the whole year. What do you think, Paul? Um, I I think a lot of the same things that I think about the Eagles when it comes to Houston. Um, I think there's only one person in the history of the league who's ever been able to be a GM and a coach. And I think that's because he has an overall just hatred for players. <laughs> and, and obviously that's going to be Bill Belichick. He, he just brings you in and he will use and abuse you and then kick you out when, when you're not worth anything anymore. Uh, short of that, uh, being a GM and a coach, it, it's, it's too much to ask of, of these people. And uh, I think that, how much are how much are the Texans missing DeAndre Hopkins, who's setting record after record for the Cardinals? He has the most receptions through the first three games as anybody with a new team. Um, it, it's at this point, I, I think a lot like the Eagles, the Houston Texans just don't have a lot of a talent on their team. Um, I mean. But, you know, you got Fuller and Stills both have had some injury issues. Then you signed Randall Cobb, whose best years were like five years ago with the Packers. Every year since then, he's pretty much just been injured. So when your top three receivers are, are injury prone and the best player on your team gets traded for David Johnson, who just averaged 1.8 yards per carry. There, there's not a lot to work with. So I've been saying this for quite a while, but I, I think it's time for Bill O'Brien to get out of town. Yeah, I definitely think that his time is going to be numbered for sure. So the next game on the docket is the Titans versus the Vikings. This was an exciting game. Titans pulling it out 31 to 30. Derrick Henry, man, doing Derrick Henry things, as we like to say. 26 carries for 119 yards and two touchdowns. Ryan Tannehill being Ryan Tannehill, 23 for 37, 321 yards, passing, no touchdowns, and an interception. I don't think you can have a much more Ryan Tannehill game than that. Maybe throw a few more interceptions and they still win, but I don't know. Kirk Cousins had a very Kirk Cousins-esque game, 16 for 27, 251 yards, three touchdowns, and two interceptions. Dalvin Cook also having a day, 22 carries, 181 yards, and a touchdown. I mean, man, it's been absolutely a lot of fun to watch Dalvin Cook's career, especially watching him set a career high. And then Justin Jefferson, 175 yards, and that was the most in a game by a Vikings rookie since Randy Moss. The Vikings became the first team in NFL history to have an individual with at least 175 rushing yards and an individual with at least 175 receiving yards in the same game. But Minnesota still lost 31 to 30 to Tennessee, dropping to 0 and 3 for the first time since 2013, the season prior to hiring coach Mike Zimmer. Kirk Cousin has has six interceptions through the first three games, matching his total from the entire 2019 season. So what do you think, Paul? What were your thoughts on the game? Uh, well, it, it's very encouraging as a Packer fan to see the projected number two team or since some people had the Vikings number one ahead of the Packers falling apart because at 0-3, your, your season is not looking very good. And I don't know what the odds are, how many teams have done it, but there aren't a lot of teams that have come back from 0-3 to make the playoffs. Um, Justin Jefferson is insane. I think that he's going to end up filling the, the shoes of Stefan Diggs. Um, I don't know why. To, just just as confusing as the, the Texans getting rid of DeAndre Hopkins, if you're the Vikings, you, you tell Stefan Diggs to shut up, lace up his cleats, and get on the field. And if you're Kirk Cousins, you throw him the ball. And he didn't do that last year, so now he's off to Buffalo and having a great season. But Justin Jefferson's going to be very good. 
Um, if you have a middle of the road quarterback like Kirk Cousins, they really could use Stefan Diggs back on that team though, because if you have three good receivers and potentially two great ones and in, in uh Stefan Diggs and uh, I think that Justin Jefferson is going to be something special. Uh, Dalvin Cook, it, it really hurts to see him running all over people because I know that when they play the Packers, there's a good chance he's going to run all over the Packers. Um, he's a phenomenal player and has been since he came out of Florida State. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's fun to watch the Vikings do this because, you know, as we say, Minnesota doing Minnesota things. Um, <laughs> And everything about this game is is really exactly what you think about it. Derrick Henry, Dalvin Cook, huge games. Justin Jefferson having a breakout, and Brian Tannehill not throwing any touchdown passes. With Kirk Cousins getting two interceptions, there's it, it's exactly how you thought it would play out. Yep, almost a hundred percent. What do you think, Ralph? Well, the Vikings go on the zero and three. Um, you know, we, we, we uh, what Paul said uh, about Bill O'Brien. I think you can make the same case for uh, uh, Zimmer over there in Minnesota. I mean, he's had plenty of opportunities to uh, to get this the, the proverbial ship righted uh, in Minnesota, uh, but um, you know, continues to come up short uh, in, in playoffs and when they, you know, I mean, obviously that play against new Orleans was just a, a, a crazy play, but um, you know, he just can't get over the hump. I mean, he's a great coach, great defensive guy, but um, just can never turn that corner. Um, so I, I would look to see, you know, after this year, if uh, this trend continues with Minnesota, I mean, they're own three, uh, obviously not a good shot to make the playoffs starting at 0-3. Uh, is Cousins, is this his last year of that deal? Uh, he just signed a new deal in the uh, offseason, didn't he? Oh, did or he? That last? It was either this year or last year, but he's he signed a new deal, and he, he's getting paid again. Because that would just fit, like, you know, if, if Zimmer goes and, and then you get rid of Cousins and, you know, as, you know like we kind of talked about with the Eagles, you know, you know, that now's the time I think they got to blow that up and, and start over and get themselves a young quarterback um, that they can, you know, grow and develop with with Dalvin Cook being young and Justin Jefferson now. I mean, now's the time where I think they have a chance to um, get young again, get get quick uh, and, and change their whole uh, offensive scheme because. Uh, I mean, he got Dalvin Cook back there. I mean, that guy's – he's incredible. If he can stay healthy, he, he's going to be something. Do you think they have any regrets about getting rid of Teddy Bridgewater for Kirk Cousins? I think you have to have – at least if you're not second-guessing it, you know, if you're not thinking it, you know, I, I think they have – somebody's got to think it, you know. I mean, we're yeah. thinking it. So I, I'm happy to see Teddy Bridgewater at least get through healthy the first couple of games, see him get his first win this last week. Uh, that was going to be one of the honorable mentions. I forgot to I forgot to put it on the list for this week, so I'll just mention it now. So definitely happy to see him at least stay healthy through the first couple of weeks and then finally get a win this week. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I didn't like him as a Viking because he was so talented, and I, I could not believe they gave up Teddy Bridgewater for Kirk Cousins. As a Packers fan, I don't know that I've ever been happier with something <laughs> the Vikings did. <laughs> so the next game on the docket is, I think, Possibly one of the best games of the weekend and also was the game that I think killed each and every one of our predictions <laughs> for the weekend. And that was the Bills versus the Rams. Rams falling to the Bills 35 to 32. Man, what a game uh, for Josh Allen. 24 33, 311 yards, four touchdowns and an interception. I don't think. You know, with him, I think you're just as likely to have this like amazing game as you are just to watch him completely fumble and give up the whole game. So to see him put it together uh, repeatedly through the first couple of weeks has been a lot of fun to watch. I am also, as Paul is, a big uh, Tyrod Taylor fan or Tyrod Taylor fan. And I mean, it's it's also painful to see that happen because of the way the Bills treated him. But it was a lot of fun to watch the game. I thought the Rams were going to take it and the Bills were just able to march down the field. I think the Rams just left a little bit too much time on the clock. And that was just enough for the 
Bills to take advantage of it. The Rams did storm back from a 28 to 3 deficit, though, to take the lead 32 to 28 over the Bills in the first quarter. In the fourth quarter, they had had Los Angeles held on to the win. It would have been the largest comeback win in franchise history. And quarter, Bills quarterback Josh Allen had other ideas, engineering his seventh game-winning drive since the beginning of the 2019 season, the most of any quarterback in the NFL during that span of time. So Allen has 1,038 passing yards, 10 passing touchdowns over his first three games, leading the Bills to a 3-0 start. Allen is the fourth quarterback in NFL history to win each of his first three games of a season and have at least 1,000 passing yards with at least 10 passing touchdowns over those three games. Each of the previous three, Jim Kelly with the Bills in 1991, Peyton Manning with the Broncos in 2013 and Patrick Mahomes with the Chiefs in 2019. That's some great company to have there with those stats. So what did you guys think of the game? We'll start with Ralph. Well, I think L.A., you know, I mean, if we can jump to the end of the game, uh, the pass interference call uh, on fourth down, uh, which, you know, the rest throw the flag. I, I looked at that play a couple of times. I just don't see it. If, if I'm a, if I'm a Rams fan, I'm, I'm losing my mind at that point. You're, you're fourth down 20 seconds to go in the game and you get called on a PI, which gives them first down and, and, and basically a new, you know, obviously a new set of downs and, and they go on and, and they execute and they win the game. But um, it was entertaining. Uh, I, I don't, I'm, I'm surprised that LA got down that much. Uh, even more surprised that they made a game of it. Uh, Jared Goff uh, and that 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 running back they have Henderson. He he was pounding that rock, and you know the uh, their their quarterback there in in Buffalo. He's a big, strong man. I mean, did, I, we'll jump to last week. Did you see that play where he just? willed himself i mean i think there was a penalty on the play and it didn't count but he bowled like two or three guys over trying to get the first down and just an impressive um you know effort there so uh, you know that company that you listed there with uh jim kelly and uh mahomes uh, it's it's pretty pretty crazy company to have and um if he can not fumble and not turn the ball over the buffalo has got themselves their quarterback yeah i think so as well what do you think paul um well i think that the refs handed the game to the bills that that was not a pass interference on that fourth down play in the fourth quarter um it was a, a little bit on the rams for getting down as, as much as they did but i think that this is uh, another interesting thing like i touched on with the packers and saints this is this is going to be just a, something that you see this season because teams that have to travel cross country for their games, they can't do it as early as they normally would. So it's it's just part of it is doing stuff that they, they wouldn't normally have to do. And I, I think you see that in how the Rams started because at, at halftime, they're down 21 to three. And again, I, I will forever stick by that they should have won that game. But I think that the reason that they didn't is is a lot to do with the things that are shall we say outside influences on the season um good job for josh allen i don't think that i I still don't think that he's a long-term answer he doesn't complete enough passes he's big yes but what's that gonna do is that gonna have you play like cam newton and then or um andrew luck and by the time you're 30 you're out of the league without any championships to show for it because uh, if they hadn't gotten Stephon Diggs in the off season, I don't think that they're having near as good a season as they are. And I think that they just got handed a win um, due to conditions of 2020. And the referee is literally just saying, uh, but pass interference, there's pass interference. You can't review it anymore. Pass interference. Next game on the docket, we had the Bears versus the Falcons. And, uh, I think this was another game that really surprised us. The Falcons, again, just completely falling apart. Bright spot of the game, Mitch Trubisky got benched and Nick Foles came in with a dazzler. And I think if you guys just have to remember, if he didn't have those two catches, Nick Foles would have thrown five touchdown passes when he came into that game. Like, absolutely ridiculous to see. I'm so happy. I literally just had a conversation with somebody last week about, they were like, what happened to Nick Foles? 
and go through the whole story with them. And they're like, man, that really stinks. And then boom, the next day he ends up coming in, winning that game. And, you know, in a 24 hour period, I had to watch the Eagles tie the Bengals. Nick Foles drive down the field, come back victory and Jimmy Butler get to the finals with the heat. It's like, come on, man. It's like kick after kick after kick. But anyway, Bears beating the Falcons 30 to 26. Nick Foles having a day, 188 yards, three touchdowns and an interception. Mitch Trubisky getting benched, kind of doing Mitch Trubisky things. But I think the biggest story of the game is, again, the fall apart of the Atlanta Falcons. What do you have to say about this one, Paul? Um, Well, I would like to say that that when we made predictions, I said there was no way that Mitch Trubisky would go three and up. So... I, I was I was technically right. Like I I just want to make sure that we're we're calling that because the, the, if if Mitch Trubisky stays in that game, they're not winning. Um, I was very surprised that they stuck with Mitch Trubisky to start this year when they traded for Nick Foles. Then, I mean, well, if you want to beat the Falcons, what do you do? You let the Falcons lead by between fifteen and twenty five, and then you play the rest of the game. And there really isn't much else to say. Um, I don't like seeing that as a Packer fan because the Bears are chilling at three and zero and tied to the Packers on top of the division. But with Nick Foles on the field, they've got an actual leader, someone who can make throws, and that that first touchdown that turned into an interception that was a touchdown. I don't, I don't. I don't care what you say. If that wasn't a touchdown pass, then they really need to redo the rules because the, the they came down in the end zone. He had possession, or it was tied. Ties go to wide receivers in football, so there's possession. There's a touchdown. Then he lets go of the ball, and the other guy gets gets an interception. No, the play should have been dead as soon as the receiver established that he had control of the ball in the end zone, which it was tied. They were both there. So that goes to that. Not advocating for the Bears to have it any easier, but I I feel that Nick Foles kind of got screwed with that interception. I thought Jimmy Graham left him hanging out the dry, too, uh, on that other interception. I, I I know that Jimmy Graham had the touch had the touchdown, but I just thought he had a pretty lackluster game overall. The touchdown that he did have was just him basically being bigger than the other guy. How much money does Jimmy Graham at this point owe Drew Brees? Because he he left the Saints, went to the Seahawks, did nothing, went to the Packers, did nothing, and goes to the Bears and isn't doing much. Like he owes at least half of his money to Drew Brees. Drew Brees <laughs> made Jimmy Graham. Hundred percent agree. What do you think, Ralph? Well, uh, first of all, I want to say, Paul, that uh, uh, your your statement about Mitch Trubisky and and you bringing that up in your prediction from last week uh, is very funny because as I'm watching this game and I'm watching Nick Foles bring him back and um, you know seeing the, the Falcons just fall apart again. In my head, I was thinking, well, Paul was right. They, they weren't going to win with Trubisky. But because I, I remember making the call, Chicago's going to win. But I didn't, you know, who who could have predicted that Foles would be the quarterback? <laughs> oh, man, yeah. And but, that was really yeah. the game that uh, pushed you over the edge on us in predictions. We'll get into the exact record later, but uh, Ralph did win last week. He had more right than the rest of us, but uh, it was really close. It was only one game off. Really? Um, yeah, yeah. Because I'll be honest with you, I was I was making those calls kind of on on a whim, uh, and, and and trying to use my you know better judgment, I guess, if you will. But uh, um, I, I mean, come on, who who could have really seen this hold and <laughs> And Foles going in, but uh, yeah, man, uh, the Bears three and zero. How they got there, it doesn't matter. They're still three and zero, right? So, um, and and if you don't know this about me, uh, my wife, I, I love her very, very much, uh, is a Falcons fan, and I Ew. had I had uh, several uh, friends reach out to me. Uh, as a uh, safety and security check on her this weekend <laughs> to see if <laughs> she was still okay. Uh, so it's it's been uh, it's been fun, and I will say this: she called it because we're watching the game and we're on red zone, and we're seeing the score. And I'm like, oh man, Falcons are up by uh, 16 points. I said, I said you're you're safe now. They don't have a 20 point lead. They're not going to lose it, you know. And she's like, don't worry, they'll lose. They'll give it up somehow. 
and damn if they didn't. Man, it sounds like an Eagles fan if I've ever heard one. Yeah. Well, another one of the games that I think should have never been close but ended up being a pretty close game was the uh, Seattle Seahawks versus the Cowboys. Seattle pulling it out 38-31. You know, it's quite an interesting thing to look at these stats. Dak Prescott, 37 of 57, 472 yards, three touchdowns, two interceptions. But I think the more interesting one is Ezekiel Elliott, 14 carries, 34 yards, one touchdown, average 2.4 yards per carry. Dak Prescott almost rushed for more yards than Ezekiel Elliott in that game. So Russell Wilson having five passing touchdowns as the Seahawks beat the Cowboys and started 3-0 for their first time since their Super Bowl winning season in 2013. Wilson is the first player in NFL history with at least four passing touchdowns in each of his first t- the first three games of the season. Wilson's 14 passing touchdowns this season are the most in NFL history by any player in his team's first three games of a season. And then Dak Prescott with 450 passing yards last week against the Falcons, then had 472 passing yards in week three against the Seahawks. And Prescott is the first player in Cowboys history with back-to-back games of at least 400 passing yards. And I think that this is going to cement Paul's call last week that Dak Prescott will likely be one of the highest paid quarterbacks in NFL history as of next year. I think Jerry's going to see those yards and just start salivating and thinking that that's just uh, since he completely whiffed on Zeke, I think he's going to think he has to lock down uh, Dak. What do you think, Ralph? Well, I think, you know, I hate the Cowboys. Uh, We all we all know that, but uh, we barely even talk about the Cowboys on this show unless they lose, unless people hadn't figured that out yet. But yeah, go ahead. Well, I, to be honest with you, I don't want to talk about him now. But since you asked, uh, no, Dax. You know, look, the guys, the guys, a, a good quarterback, and you know, um, he's he's mobile, he's he's smart, he's efficient most of the time. Uh, there are he's he goes through. Uh, bad spells as well, but I mean Ezekiel, where he didn't, he's not, he's not showing up right now, um, you know. But is that a? I, I don't know what the uh, the reason is for that. To be honest with you, I, I didn't see much of this game. To be honest, uh, I just saw some of the uh, uh, some of the stats like Russell Wilson going, you know, berserk again. Um, but you know. In the end, Dallas is 0-3, and that makes me happy. Tyler Lockett and Russell Wilson seem to have the uh, – Dallas are 1-2, bud. They're 1-2? I thought they were 0-3. They won that one game. Remember they came back? Remember they played the Falcons? The Falcons Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. See how much I pay attention to the Cowboys? I can't stand watching them. All good, bud. I just didn't want to leave you out there to hang and dry, so just wanted to help you out a little bit. Go ahead. No, I appreciate that. Thanks for uh, thanks for bringing me back. But no, I mean, you know, I I don't want to speak too much about the Cowboys because I really don't know their struggles or, or what's going on there. But the Seahawks, I mean, if, if you had to take it right now and say who's your who's the cream of the crop in the NFC and the AFC, and I mean, if you're not saying Seattle, if they can get that defense to shore up. Uh, man, Russell Wilson is just playing lights out right now. It's crazy. I think the uh, that game would have never been close had DK Mac- Metcalf wrapped up that ball before he went into the end zone. And it's I not even the f- yeah, not even the first time that happened against the birds. You remember? I think no, it was like a what? year or two ago. Uh, he had a, a bomb he caught from Russell Wilson, and we ended up breaking it up because he was showboating before he got in the end zone. So uh, it's not the first time that he's done that. So I I think that uh, I think he'll learn his lesson, though. Hopefully he's still young, but that guy's a monster. And just watching how they are using DK and how he's running his routes now, I'm definitely very impressed. What do you think, Paul? Um, So first, I'd I'd like to point out that. So and let me just clarify. You think that Zekio Elliott is a bust? No, no, no. I don't think he's a bust. I think he disappears. You watch. I've watched him literally wave out of games in huge moments. Like, okay. I, I just think I, that he he left his heart in Cabo. I don't know what happened, but the, that Zeke never came back. Okay. And he's hungry. He's got to go have cereal. <laughs> and and that, that's fine. I can understand that. I thought you were just saying that you thought that he, he was done. Um, 
I would uh, I would like to the one thing we didn't talk about in the Falcons game that I wanted to touch on was the reemergence of Todd Gurley. Uh, I Todd Gurley he started out three carries for eight yards. He ended up having a pretty decent game, and that's the first decent game that he's had since the the early part of the Super Bowl year with the Rams. So I I thought that that, but no, I I think that Zeke is fine. I think that it a rough game. Um, I think that Dak Prescott is going to do Kirk Cousins things and get completely overpaid and not win much of anything that matters. I, I would like to to say that uh, I, I'm very sorry for Dak's loss in the offseason with his brother. I will also say that uh, him speaking out on it and talking about mental health uh, is something that is near and dear to my heart and I love that he has um, been I guess courageous enough to do it because I think that I think a lot of people are impacted by mental health struggles um, especially in 2020 where it's hard to get out and do things and uh, yeah sorry for your loss deck I know you're probably not ever going to listen to this but (laughs) sorry for for the loss there and uh, I hope him and his family can move on uh, Cowboys aren't going to do much of anything this year, being at one and two with their only win being one of the most improbable wins of the season. But I think Dak won't get paid. So being a Packers fan and seeing your former coach now with his new team, are you seeing a lot of the same things that you feel like you saw in Green Bay? Like, what are you seeing when you watch Mike McCarthy with the Cowboys this year? Uh, nothing yet, because they haven't had a lead to give up. So at this point, it's just <laughs> not winning anything. But I, I, I would like to say that it, one of my favorite things about the Cowboys over the last 20 years, 25 years since they were last any good was um, they will always fall apart at the worst time and just rip their, their fans' hearts out. I mean, Dak Prescott, throws for 472 yards and they don't win the game that that's that's insane so uh, it's i love it but with mike mccarthy if if the cowboys ever get good they'll have a lead they'll blow it it's gonna be funny so i'm i'm so glad to be rid of mccarthy i wanted him gone years before he was so the cowboys can keep him i love it because Jerry Jones needs a weak-willed coach, and after Jason Garrett, I think that Mike McCarthy is a perfect follow-up. <laughs> all right, so the last game that we're going to cover in depth for the docket of last week, and that's another game that all of us whiffed on. That's the Chiefs versus the Ravens. Chiefs coming out on top, thirty-four to twenty. Patrick Mahomes, three hundred and eighty-five yards, four touchdowns, no interceptions. Just doing Patrick Mahomes things. Lamar Jackson, man, I was shocked. 15 for 20, 28, 97 yards and one touchdown. He did have 83 rushing yards, but that just kind of shows you how the day went for uh, for the Ravens. After that first drive, I just thought the Chiefs just absolutely took all the momentum in that game and just never gave it back. They were there to hit. They were there to play. They were there to run up the score, and it showed. And I don't think at this point, what are the the Ravens are, I think, 0-3 uh, versus the Chiefs in the regular season. I, I'm i just shocked to see them get flabbergasted yet again. I really thought they were going to come to play after everything that's happened uh, over the last couple of years between these two teams. So it just was not to be for the Ravens. What do you think, Paul? Um, I, I think it's it was really interesting. I think it's very telling for how the season is going to go. Um, I mean, if the Chiefs, unless the Chiefs have an off game, are they going to lose? This offense is utterly insane. How how did they get better? I mean, they got better because Patrick Mahomes is still young. They they got a really good running back out of LSU and Edward Solaire. And uh, I, I was shocked by this game. Um, not because the Chiefs, did Chiefs things, but because the Ravens just uh, they, do, do you think that they know the game started yet? Like, did someone tell them? Because they just didn't show up at all. Um, 
Lamar showed up running the ball, but as far as throwing it, if, you, if you're an NFL quarterback and you throw under 90 or under 100 yards and your name isn't Tim Tebow, you got some explaining to do. It was a great, great, fun thing to watch. Um, an offense with Sammy Watkins, Tyree Kill, and and uh, I can't remember his first name, but Hartman. That, that's not fair. That's that's cheating. Like that, that's that's like you you you're playing Madden and you turned off the salary cap and you're making trades go through no matter what. How did you end up with this offense? It is it's just crazy. Good for Andy Reid. Love the guy. I, I don't think any coach has ever been more beloved by people who have never really had anything to do with him. So <laughs> good for him. I, I mean, he was the Eagles for forever, and and then he had the his son go down, and yeah. And so, I I will always root for the guy. He seems very nice. He doesn't try to push the push the buck anywhere. He always takes the blame for whenever anything's going on. So I'm uh, very happy for Andy Reid. Not very happy as I'm not Chiefs fan. <laughs> that, <laughs> that just seems like a, a connection that's going to go on for years and years. They just they seem to have a really good relationship, and I don't like that because it's not my team. <laughs> what do you think, Ralph? Well, I, I watched that game, uh, you know, start to finish, and like we talked about uh, kind of before we started um, uh, recording is, you know, you when, instead of watching a game on Red Zone, you – when you watch a game live, uh, you get the full feel of the game. And, you know, the, the score at the end was, what, 34-20, um, somewhere. And uh, I think that was the final score. But that score is so not indicative of the actual game. You know, um, the Ravens just, like Paul said, I mean, it never felt close. It never felt close. It, it never felt like uh, watching that game. And, and my father-in-law is a, is a Chiefs fan. Uh, yeah, I know my family here is all over the place with their fandom, but um, you know he's he's over here cursing and cussing at, at, at an incomplete pass, and I'm going, dude, I'm o two and one as an Eagles fan, and you have this gluttony of of riches here, like you know an incomplete pass, you can you can get over that, you know. I mean, you got Patrick Mahomes out here making this game look stupid easy, and. and and it, what it, it was an entertaining game. I, I, I enjoyed watching that game. I mean, um, you know, Lamar Jackson just he, he he was small in a big game. I mean, when you think about this, the, the, the game itself uh, from from a, a seeding perspective, you know, you get a tiebreaker now. The Chiefs had the tiebreaker over Baltimore. Uh, if it comes down to a record for that, you, you know, remember, we only get one bye. You know, you get one, the number one seed, and then and that's it. You don't get second place buys anymore. Um, so this is going to be a pretty big game coming down the stretch. If it, you know, if it comes down to it, it's going to mean a whole lot. And you're going to look back at week three, going, "Wow, that was a big, that was a really big game in the season." But uh, Patrick Mahomes, five touchdowns, just making it look stupid easy again. Um, he's he's like Paul said, playing Madden, and and just you know. Chuck and pray and and I mean, those those passes that 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 first pass to Hardman, uh, I mean he just he just laced it in there. He he would have been better off just walking up there and handing it to him. Uh, I mean that's how good this guy is. And he, I enjoy watching him. Uh, I enjoy watching the Chiefs. Uh, as Paul said, um, I always root for Andy Reid. Uh, I never root against him. Um, do I feel like his time as an Eagles coach? had come to an end. Yeah. I think, you know, the, the saying of he wore out his welcome kind of comes to mind, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll never root against him because he's, he's a good guy. He's, he's a good person. And, and I wish him, you know, nothing but the best. Uh, and uh, man, the chiefs are impressive. They're they're If it's not their super bowl to, to lose this year, uh, I, I don't know who, who's going to win. I, I just have a question for the two of you guys. Like, So I think there's some things in sports we can all agree about. And some of those things are, are we have genetically engineered people now. <laughs> Michael Phelps was genetically engineered to be a swimmer. I don't care what anybody says, because how does that happen? <laughs> that, that, that just shouldn't happen. Uh, Usain Bolt, genetically engineered to be a runner. That That has to be the truth. And it feels like now Patrick Mahomes was genetically engineered to be a Madden football player. And, 
it's, it's just crazy. I, I don't think I can be the only one that feels like that. So, yeah. Yeah. And Mike Trout being the, uh, for baseball as well. So yeah, I, uh, I definitely agree. It's a fun time as far as sports go. I mean, and, and to not have it be it's tough with you when you say that, because it makes me think of the steroid era. And I'm hoping that none of those names end up on that list. But uh, it's it's definitely a fun time to be a sports fan for sure. But it's also yeah, something I'll, to where. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, bud. No, I'll, I'll agree with that. And I'll also say just one more. LeBron James, 100 million percent genetically engineered to be the second best basketball player of all time. <laughs> <laughs> oh perfect so the next little spot here uh if you guys can bear with me as i get through it but this is going to be our honorable mention section please feel free to chime in at any time and uh and let me know if you have any thoughts on it tom brady threw three touchdown passes and finally looked like his old self as the buccaneers coasted to a win over the broncos speaking of old Brady is the oldest player in NFL history with three passing touchdowns in a game. At 43 years and 55 days old, he is 17 days older than George Blanda was when he had three touchdown passes for the Raiders versus the Steelers in 1970. Wow. Yeah. Speaking of Tom's old team, the Patriots had 250 rushing yards in their week three win over the Raiders. Sony Michelle had 117 rushing yards on just nine carries, the most rushing yards in team history by a player that had fewer than 10 carries in a game. Rex Burkhead added two rushing touchdowns and a receiving touchdown, the first Patriots player with at least two rushing touchdowns and at least one receiving touchdown in a single game since James White in the Super Bowl versus the Falcons. Yeah, we just keep going back to that game, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> well, on that game, Brandon uh, and and Paul, uh, both of you, um, something that I've noticed with Cam, do you notice any difference in the way he's throwing the ball this year in his mechanics? Hundred yes. percent, completely different. Yes, they they have rebuilt him. He he gets his arms square. He has a faster delivery. It it's it, it's exactly what he needed. I always thought that. Ron Rivera was not a good fit for Cam Newton. And now that he's with a coaching staff and he's got Josh McDaniels there, and I don't know who their quarterbacks coach is, but whoever is working with him on his form, you are 100% correct, Ralph. His mechanics are so much better than they were before. I mean, he's he's zipping that ball like I've never seen him do. And, and the way that he – you know the the speed of which his arm is is is, thro is flowing through the process of the throw is just I mean he's lightning quick and and he's just stand I, I just noticed it to, um, watching some highlights and I noticed it a little bit during you know watching Red Zone or whatever but just just his his whole style I mean if you were to take <clears throat> if you were to take a a, a a motion capture of of the game yesterday. Uh, or excuse me, on Sunday, um, and then take a clip of one of his games last year in Carolina and side-by-side side him. I'd really be curious to see the difference in his mechanics. Yeah, easy easy enough to do. We can definitely do that. It's just – it's night and day. He, he looks like a quarterback now. Hey, guys, if I can just interject real quick, uh, just going back to our conversation earlier about Winston – uh, and his deal with the Saints, uh, we what I see is he signed a deal with the Saints that'll pay him one point one million dollars for 2020. Uh, it includes a one hundred and forty eight thousand dollars signing bonus and a base salary of nine hundred and fifty two thousand um, dollars. Winston could earn as much as three point four million dollars uh, if he hits all of the uh, available incentives. Are, are they playing incentives, though, so he's not going to hit them. <laughs> Yeah, more than likely not, I would have to imagine. But uh, thanks for clearing that up, Ralph. I do appreciate that. So yeah, one other thing I wanted to bring up for you, uh, Paul, and I wanted to get your comment on this. According to Next Gen Stats, the Patriots aligned with the quarterback under center on 81.6% of their carries in week three, amassing 245 rushing yards and 7.9 yards per carry on those runs. In weeks one and two, the Patriots aligned with the quarterback under center on just 44.8% of the carries and averaged 4.4 yards per carry on those runs. So do you think that that is something that, you know, would you see them changing up the offense from week to week and the way that they're doing things, even just lining up the quarterback in different ways? 
Do you think that that's going to speak to them using Cam differently throughout the season, or do you still feel like they're going to be battering ramming him pretty much until he falls apart? Um, well, I think that those are, are different questions uh, because I, how many rushing yards did Cam have this week? I, I didn't watch the Patriots game, but did he have a lot of rushing yards this week or, or attempts? He had nine carries for 27 yards. Nine for 27. So, I, I mean, without watching it, I wouldn't know if those are scrambles or, or what. Uh, but so most of the time when he was lining up in I, the, the Patriots don't really play out of the pistol, they play shotgun. So when you play out of the pistol, whether you're running your quarterback or, or your running back, you think your running back is a little bit of a head of steam. Uh, the, I mean, there's a reason why running back set up seven yards behind the line of scrimmage when you're playing in shotgun you've already got the defensive line on you by the time you're getting handed the ball and taking your first step. So putting, putting him under center is going to be a big benefit to Sony Michelle, James White, when he gets back um, and, and anybody that they play, because there's a reason why running backs don't start lined up perfectly. They get the step and, and then they can accelerate as soon as they hit the ball. Um, I think that it's smart to do this because if you're not going to play in the pistol and you want to use your running backs, then yeah, get, get Cam under center, get him hand, the ball handed off and let the running backs do their thing. So I think that this is just a, a matter of style where they're doing this just because they don't seem to have a lot of plays out of the pistol. But if you look at the Rams and the Chiefs, they play out of the pistol quite a bit and their running backs get far better numbers on, on those plays and Lamar Jackson does too, but I mean, Lamar Jackson is one of a kind at this point. So let's not compare Lamar to Cam because one of them is like what six one, one hundred and eighty pounds, and the other one is six five and four hundred and fifty pounds of sheer muscle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, it's. I, I think it's. I think it's Josh McDaniels adapting, um, but I. I still think nine carries for Cam is too much. All right. Well, we're running a little bit long. We're having a really good time. So I don't want to go too much closer to two hours because we probably nobody will listen. So what I want to do is let's get into our predictions. Last week, Ralph took it going nine and five. Paul and I tied going eight and six. So we're going to start off our predictions for NFL week four. Are you guys ready? Oh, yeah. Let's do it. Awesome. All right. NFL week four action. We're starting off Thursday night football. This is going to be the uh, barn burner of the week, the battle of the bottom, if you will. The Broncos versus the Jets. Paul, who do you got? Uh, for the second consecutive week, the United States of America loses. That's, that's it. It's, how, how, are, how is the NFL giving us these games on Thursday? Like, do they really want people to watch Thursday games? Or are they just trying to get like a game that they don't want on Sunday out of the way? Um, the, I, I think that uh, I, I'm going to go with the Jets in this one because uh, I I can't see the Broncos stringing anything together right now. Ralph? Uh, I, again, I agree with Paul. Um, I think there's some sort of internal joke in the league office that says, what's the crappiest game we can put on Thursday night and still get crazy ratings and, and see what they can come up with? Um <laughs> But seriously, in regards to the game, I mean, New York's defense is a little better than what people are going to are, are talking about right now, giving them credit for Denver's obviously uh, um, quarterbackless again since uh, <laughs> since Peyton Manning left. Uh, so I'll, I'll take the Jets as well. I will agree on that one. Moving on to the next game we have uh, starting off on Sunday morning, Saints versus the Lions in an early tilt. What do you think, Paul? Uh, Saints all the way. Ralph? Well, I mean, if this was a, uh, uh, a pick em league or what are, the, what are those uh, suicide leagues, if you will, uh, I wouldn't – I really – this would be a coin flip for me. Uh, Detroit played pretty well last week. It could be a game that I could see them winning. Um, but I, I think that New Orleans is, uh, is going to be um, going to be ready for this one. So I'm going to take New Orleans as well. I'm taking the Saints because I'm fairly positive Michael Thomas is going to start. Uh, next game I, on the I list. Don't think that, I, I just don't think that Matt Patricia can beat 
uh, Sean Payton in anything aside from maybe a lucky game of checkers once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very much agree. It's kind of like your comment last week about Gruden sitting over there chewing gum. Yeah, just like that. <laughs> Next game on the docket, we have uh, Tom Brady and the Bucks versus the Chargers. I think that's definitely going to be a good game. Justin Herbert's been playing pretty good through the first couple of weeks. What do you think, Ralph? Bucks are the uh, are, are the easy pick here, but uh, I'm I'm going to go LA in a, in an upset. Paul, uh, I I really want to pick the Chargers in this one, but I think with their defense being a little bit depleted and with Gronk coming back into form a little bit and getting into game shape. Um, I, I think that the Bucks are going to run away with this one. I am going Bucks as well. I think Brady's feeling it right now, and I just think that things are going to continue on. I think Gronk is going to continue to be more of just like a decoy, but, man, they're start- him and Mike Evans are really starting to heat up. Next game on the docket, Jaguars versus the Bengals. Bengals doing pretty good to upset the Eagles season's hopes last week. Are they going to continue to keep that uh, on a decent track here with Joe Burrow? What do you think, Paul? Uh, I'm I'm going to go with a little bit of an upset, I think, and pick the Bengals. Um, I, I don't think that the Jags have much of the team aside from a middling quarterback. Um, I, I think that Joe Burrow is good, not great, but he's a rookie. He's got plenty of time to learn, but I think that uh, – He's playing with confidence, and I think that that's going to continue against uh, an under-talented Jacksonville team. Ralph? Jacksonville burnt me last week. I picked them to win the Thursday night game, and Miami uh, uh, made me uh, look a little silly there. So uh, I'm going to go away from them. Uh, I think uh, I think Burrow played a, played a pretty good game last week against Philly. I uh, think he and Tyler Boyd have a good connection there, so I'll take Cincy there. I agree. I, I have absolutely zero faith in the Jags to do anything at this point. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. Next game on the docket, Vikings versus the Texans. So are the Vikings going to keep sliding and Deshaun going to keep doing OK things here? Or is the Texans going to finally find a way to stop the run and, and actually get a win in this game? What do you guys think? We'll start with Ralph. Uh, I'm going to take Houston in this one for no other reason than it's a home game. I think it's a it's a coin flip. Paul? Uh, I'm I'm going to go with the Vikings here because I think in 2020 home doesn't matter uh, like in other seasons, and I think that Dalvin Cook is just going to explode all over Texas. 100% agree. I think since the since they have not been able to to stop the run through the first three weeks, I think that will continue to happen, and Dalvin Cook will have a huge game. Next game on the dock would be the Seahawks versus the Dolphins. I would have said, man, do we even have to talk about this one? But after last week, I guess we do. What do you think, Paul? Seahawks. Seahawks. I agree. All right. Next game on the list, we have the Steelers versus the Titans. What do you guys think? We'll start with Paul. Uh, maybe this is dumb. I'm, I'm going to pick Tennessee, but that could just be my hatred of Ben Roethlisberger. So I'm, I'm going to go with Tennessee because I think that Derrick Henry is – going to run away from from TJ Watt as much as possible. <laughs> Ralph? Man, that's that's a sneaky good game for for this week and it's a right? block game. Can they can they take Philly and San Fran out of the 820 game and make Pittsburgh and Tennessee the 820 game? I don't think they is... can flex this early, can they? No, but I'm I mean I'm I'm joking more or less. Sure. But, <laughs> um man, that's that's a sneaky good game. Um it's, it's for me it's again i mean this one's probably even more of a coin flip i'll go pittsburgh i think i'm gonna go pittsburgh as well um man they did good for me last week and pulling out for me uh, an extra point that really helped me tie paul so i was happy with that one so i'll continue to ride high on that one next game in the one o'clock hour is the browns versus the cowboys i know we're not super interested in this one but uh what do you guys think we'll start with ralph uh, I'll go Dallas because I don't I don't see them uh, I don't see them going down to uh, to Cleveland. Paul, um, I think that this is going to be a season where the Cowboys play to the level of their competition, and I think that the Cowboys are probably going to end up eight and eight because of it. But I I don't think that the Cowboys lose to the Browns because as much as I want to be a Browns fan and and, and cheer for them. I can't do that. They're terrible. So I got to go with the Cowboys here. Man, I 
now I'm just tempted to pick against them because I really don't think that we should all pick Dallas. It's just like so <laughs> against the show. So I'm going to have to go the Browns just off of principle. Um, <laughs> well, I hope you're right. Yeah, we'll see. I hope so, too. Uh, next one on the docket is Cardinals versus the Panthers. Uh, Kyler Murray had a little bit of a bad week last week, throwing three interceptions. Teddy Bridgewater got his first win. How do we guys see this one playing out, Ralph? Uh, well, I mean, just judging face value, Kyler Murray uh, playing playing well. Obviously, they didn't win last week with the against the Lions. Uh, Carolina goes in. Um, beats uh, they beat the, the Chargers right so uh, yeah I'm going to take Carolina at home all right Paul um, I am going to pick the Cardinals and I have DeAndre Hopkins with at least 150 yards receiving I agree I'm taking the Cardinals on that one I think Kyler Murray is going to be pissed about last week and is going to want to make up for it you know I'm going to I'm sticking with Carolina but after I said Carolina I almost bit my tongue but um, I'll stick with it just because that was my initial gut reaction there so next one on the docket is the Colts versus the Bears uh, are we going to see Nick Foles and the Bears come out over top of the Colts or are we going to see uh, Philip Rivers continue to do okay things over there in Indianapolis what do you guys think Paul uh, have they have, okay so have they announced that Foles is going to be starting yet or yeah. yes they, Foles is the starter for the rest announced. of the season they, okay so they have officially said that he is the starter for the rest of the season yes they have okay then I'm going to go with Foles riding high um, mainly because I think that Philip Rivers has been overrated ever since he was backing up Drew Brees in, in San Diego We'll say the Philip Rivers has the os- the best uh, bus to get himself to the games. Have you seen it? No. It's pretty awesome. I would say Google it if you have not. Ralph, what do you think? Okay. I'm I'm tempted to take the Colts just because now that Foles has the reins, uh, you know, we've seen Foles at his best. We've seen Foles at his worst. Uh you know, when he's with the Jaguars, now granted he got hurt the first game. Um, the Rams, he had nobody around him. Chicago, he's got some weapons. But my my gut says Colts. All right. I'm going to go with Nick Foles and Dub Bears, and we'll see how that rolls out for us. I think that things are going to continue on for him. I, I just really love the way that he played last week, and if he plays like that, I think that he'll continue on with his form. All right, last game, 1 o'clock hour, Ravens versus the Washington football team. Do I even need to ask, are any of you taking Washington in this one? Is Alex Smith going to play? <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> I'm, 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 no. <laughs> All right, and the afternoon games, we got the Rams versus the Giants. Are the Rams going to come back and for victory versus the New York Giants? What do you think, Ralph? Uh, Rams, I, I don't think New York has a, has a chance next week. Paul? Uh, I'm going to go with the Rams as well. Same for me. I don't even think, I think without Saquon, the Giants just have too few we- weapons to get anything going. Uh, oh, they, I think this is Daniel a, Jones. <laughs> I think it's going to be probably one of the more interesting games of the week next week in the uh, afternoon hour. Patriots versus the Chiefs. We'll start with Paul. Uh, I'm going to go with the Chiefs. Ralph? Same. Chiefs. Ah, uh, man. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to do the same. I uh, I I feel like I'm going to regret this, but I'll stick with the Chiefs just because they made me eat it last week. All right, next game, we have the Raiders versus the Bills. I think that's going to be another good game as well. Is Josh Allen going to continue to show great form, or is John Gruden and the Raiders going to keep ro- keep things rolling on through this season? What do you guys think? We'll start with Ralph. Uh, Buffalo going across country, coming off a high of the of, uh, – Beating the Rams at home last week, um, going to be a tough play against Vegas. They're 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 a good team, uh, so uh, I think I'm I'm going to go the Raiders. Paul, yeah, I'm going to go with the Raiders as well. I was really hoping that Ralph was was going to go the other way on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I think this is really tough because um, I just think that with the Raiders that have found a great offense for themselves this year. Derek Carr is really looking in form. Waller looks fantastic. They're running back. Is it Josh Jacobs? 
uh, is just fantastic. I really feel like the Raiders are probably going to keep in form, but I would not be surprised to see the Bills continue to do things. So, but I will follow suit and I will say the Raiders as well. Next one on the docket, we have the Birds versus the 49ers. Man, this one's going to be a tough one. I don't see any way. I'll pick first on this one just because I've picked last on every other one. Uh, I really feel like the 49ers are probably going to have a hard time not winning this game. (laughs) Uh, If they just hand the ball off, I don't think the Eagles have the secondary to stop the running game. They have been unable to stop the running game this entire season thus far. So I really don't see how the 49ers aren't going to win that game. So, but man, it still feels really painful to pick against the birds, but I'm going to go 49ers. What do you guys think? I'll start with Ralph. Uh, for no other reason than if I just start picking against them and they win, great. Uh, I'm going to take the Niners. Paul? <laughs> uh, you're dumb. <laughs> um, I, I think that at this point, Alabama might have a chance against, against the Eagles, so I'm going to go with the 49ers. Wow. Wow, that, that, that escalated quickly. <laughs> I just I just think that Nick Saban can out coach Peterson. His 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 inner Packer fans coming out now. He couldn't hold it back throughout the whole show. <laughs> Speaking of which, we're on the last game. Uh Packers versus the Falcons and Monday night football. This might be the biggest snooze fest of the entire year. I'm just gonna watch Aaron Jones go crazy. Uh what do you guys think? We'll start with Paul. All right, so a couple things that <laughs> Who came up with Matty Ice as a nickname? Like, how how stupid do you feel at this point? I'm pretty sure he gave that nickname. to himself, didn't he? <laughs> I, too. I just think that that is the like that's the worst nickname ever. The Ice, yeah. And at one point, this dude was he was in the conversation with Aaron Rodgers. Please, the Packers. I, I having been a Packers fan, I could see this being a game that that they go in overconfident and lose. But I mean. Aaron Jones, he wants to get paid. I, and I just don't think that Aaron Jones by himself will let the Packers lose. So I think the Packers are are going to win this game. Um, but I could also see an upset if the Falcons have any life left at all at this point. Uh, I'm going to pick the Packers as well, just because I, I think the Falcons cornerbacks are awful. And I think you're just going to watch. The Packers or Aaron Rodgers just tear them apart. What do you think, Ralph? Well, I mean, I want to, I want to take the pack, but after that, that Doug Peterson Alabama comment, whew, man, Paul coming with the heat there. Uh, I gotta catch up to you somehow if I can yeah. get in your head and mess with you. Well, <laughs> some of these picks I made this week might, <laughs> might, might do the job for you. <laughs> uh, no, I honestly, uh, Green Bay. I, I don't think Atlanta's got enough for them. Uh, I think Dan Quinn is. Uh, his own worst enemy, and uh, this will be the last year uh, coaching the Falcons for sure. Oh, oh come on, Ralph. The, the Falcons could do it, though. Why don't you, you pick the Falcons? <laughs> <laughs> they have Julio Jones. <laughs> uh, not on the field. <laughs> yeah, I know, but they have Julio Jones. <laughs> <laughs> Julio Jones has one hamstring right now. Uh, yeah, well, that I still might put him out there. I mean, it's it's been pretty bad for the Falcons as of late. But uh, Julio Jones on one hamstring is still better than any two Eagles wide receivers. I knew you. I, right I set you. I mean, good good job on the spike there. I set that up for you. I, I it's hard not to agree with that. To be honest with you, um, <laughs> set him up, you knock him down. It's teamwork, baby. What are you gonna do? <laughs> well. We're just shy of two hours. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Um, We'll be back again, hopefully next week, same time, same place. And again, make sure you check us out on YouTube, SoundCloud, also Spotify and Apple Music Podcasts. We're everywhere you can basically find podcasts. So definitely check us out. Make sure you leave us a like, dislike if you disliked it. Make sure you subscribe to stay up to date with all things of the Muff Punt Podcast. I want to thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, Paul. Again, I hope you guys have an awesome week. And uh, take it easy. Thanks. Don't give us a dislike. If you don't if you don't like us, then, then fuck off. But don't press the dislike button. That's just mean. It's my turn! 
It is. You told me it was my turn. You can talk all that you want hey, to, hey, yell and scream. Okay, you lost. it is my you turn. You lost the game. Take as long as you want. You still lost.